Thank you very much, Erica, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come to this zoology seminar. Very happy to be here, and uh, I will try to introduce you this topic that I call civilizational behavior in birds, causes and consequences. And I will do that with uh, introducing to some some different species of birds, like cattle egret, brown booby, <laughs> and uh, black kite, uh, and uh, give examples of what are the things you can do studying civilizational behavior in birds, and what could be the different solutions you think about why, why this behavior evolved in the first place. So let's take a look at wha where do these uh, Civilized behavior occurs. It occurs in, in like imperial eagles, uh, snowy owls, cattle egrets, black kites. So familiar birds to to many of you. And um, we have divided this uh, civilized behaviors in two types: facultative civilized behavior that does not occur always and obligate civilizational behavior. And I will talk about both of these today. And uh, one of the more famous studies has done been done by blue-footed booby, by Hugh Drummond and others in Mexico. And uh, but there have been a number of studies also on different species of eagles. And uh, maybe white-tailed eagle is actually not a good example because Many of the devoted uh, eagle, well, white eagle uh, investigators say, ah, it doesn't occur in this species. They feed them a lot on fish. And I also took up kestrel here because only in a few species of uh, falcons uh, we have observed civilized behavior. And I will come back to that later in the talk. So, uh, to put this is in a broader perspective, we can talk about life history, you know, life history theories, and uh, that in many cases parents establish a trade-off between quality and quality of the offspring. Uh, and brood reduction is seen as a strategy to adjust family size uh, if the conditions of food should be bad. And in quite a few species, siblings are aggressive against each other. And this may end fatally. And this is what we are talking about today, siblicidal behavior. So siblicidal brood reduction is, could be one strategy. I was uh, discussing <laughs> with a mathematician in my university. We also have a time for, for uh, research in like in mathematics, computer science, and studying this civilization in a dynamic way. And you can see why uh, this could be good, because you have a civilization, uh, the parents giving birth to young, and there could be brood deduction, or yes or no, the brood can be reduced from three to two, or not. And uh, you can decide discuss about the costs and benefits, profits. And uh, this could be related in uh, uh, a big way into carrying capacity in, in the environment. It's related to competitors within the nest, but maybe also between different individuals in the population. And about cooperator. You can be a cooperator, if you uh, think about this as a sibling, or you can be a competitor. What are then the costs and the benefits? So this could also be a mathematical model, has been done uh, also a few studies about this. And it's also in related to one of the famous debates about parent conflict. Conflict, who is winning, the parent or the offspring. Uh, so I said that uh, we also have obligate civilized birds, where they, in this uh, species, they lay two eggs, but they fledge almost never too young. And one of the famous here in Europe is the bearded vulture, where they actually have used all this also in conservation bio biology, because as they know, the, 
the elder chick will kick out the, the younger chick or, or kill it, they, they save it so they can keep it in another nest or raise it uh, experimental in lab. And harpy eagle is another one. But I will talk today about the brown booby, so relative to the blue-footed booby, where we observe the obligate stabilizer. So, uh, first to take a background to this evolution of stabilizer behavior. Uh, and uh, it said it, it uh, needs five different prerequisites for stabilizer behavior to occur. And one of the most important is sibling size hierarchy. And <coughs> in general, uh, this topic is also related about conflict behavior. Because as we see it, ah, the kids are fighting. Um, we should try to stop it. That's how we think as humans. And in these uh, studies, there have also been a lot of game theory models. Because you can, can think about this as a game theory. You're a recuperator or you're conflicted. And uh, we also talk about advantages and disadvantages of fighting, as we do may, maybe also uh, as humans many cases. Uh, so, these five different characteristics I talk about is, uh, which is common to uh, all civilized birds, almost, competition for food, provision of food to the nestlings in small units, uh, weaponry, that they should have strong builds that we see, like in the boobies, and competitive disparities between siblings, and spatial confinement. And among uh, four of these are considered uh, essential preconditions for the evolution of aggression, whereas competitive disparities could we talk also about a consequence rather than a cause of the civilized behavior. So uh, today I will then, as I said, present three different studies that I made. First one is about the brown booby. Second about the cattle egret. And third one, the black kite. So the first study was done on brown boobies in Mexico. And um, we did this study, we did several studies, but uh, the study I'm presenting here today is about what we call the an experimental test of the insurance hypothesis. And I will explain how it goes. So, in obligate simplicity species, as the brown booby, female lays one or two eggs, but never or almost never, maybe has been one case in thousands and thousands, that they raise two young to fledging. So we ask, why does it ever lay two eggs? Why doesn't it just lay one egg if, uh, if they never fledge more than one young? And then this insurance hypothesis that you could use also in, in many other cases, but in this case that the birds are practicing this obligate civilized behavior uh, that they lay an insurance egg if the first egg should fail shortly after hatching. So it seems pretty, pretty obvious uh, that uh, yeah, 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 we could accept that, but we have to try it. So we did this study on a small island, Isla Pajarera, small Pacific Islands, located in the Bahia de Chamela. So it's five kilometers off the coast of the province of Jalisco in Mexico. And I just took a map here, and Jalisco is here. It's this province I over here. And uh, we did this study more or less, where the arrow is indicating. This is uh, the bay, and we did this study on this island, uh, uh, Isla Pajarera where there is a colony of um, brown boobies. So it's a pan-tropical marine bird, and uh, typical breeding colonies on tropical islands. 
and they lay the two eggs average five to two five point two days apart and they start the incubation almost immediately. So then there will be a hatching interval as you can understand, which is about four point five days. And uh, as in many birds, male and uh, male and female share incubation and don't look after nesting. So that's common in, in most birds actually. This shows the distribu worldwide distribution of the brown booby, some different subspecies. This shows the female and the male. They don't build a, a very, very big nest, but it's still a nest. Uh, there is some difference between male and the female. So the female is into on the left on that pic picture, and male on the right. And this is a male in his life. So uh, the aim of our study was to do an experiment to test this hypothesis. And uh, that they lay this insurance egg. So just to describe uh, shortly about the design of the experiment, search for pairs because there was one pair here, one pair there, one pair there, etc. More or less like that, at, at least at some places. So there were really frequent amounts of, of nest. Uh, and uh, so we searched in the colony because not all lay two eggs. That's complicated the experiment in my opinion a little bit. Why don't la all lay two eggs? Because some only lay one egg. But we searched for, for, for uh, clutches that lay two eggs. We marked them A and B and then we randomly decided one of these two neighbor clutches to be experiment. So we remove one egg and the other is controlled. So, and we marked always the, the eggs A and B. So, uh, after this, we monitored, like we, we followed up these uh, pairs during incubation, recorded hatching success, and followed the brood until young were at least 60 days old. And we have seen that this is approximate of fledging success. That there is very little mortality up to 90 days when they are like in independent. So, oops. So this is added booby with the chick. They sit pretty grown up. Uh, after this, they would develop more and more feathers. So uh, in this first uh, study, we saw that the control ones. We, we haven't removed any eggs, had a higher hatching success than the experiment. So basically this shows that there's significant difference in hatching success between control and experimental clutches. And uh, remember we said we followed the brood until the young were at least 60 days old. Uh, first we checked them at time day, 10 days post hatching. There was even a more significant effect between these two experimental treatments. So that survival was higher 10 days post hatching. And at this time, most of this brood reduction had taken place in most of the broods. And uh, uh, we followed them uh, at least until at least. 60 days old in this experiment, which is an ex approximate age where they assume to reach independence. And when they have reached age 60 days, there was almost a triple advantage for control broods in survival of young. So conclusion in this first study on brown boobies, it's uh, in accordance with the very hi high hatching failure in this species, they lay their eggs on the ground. And if you imagine, it's, it's very, very hot on the ground. So therefore, they have a very high hatching failure. And we also consider the most important insurance benefit of a second egg is against egg hatching failure. So, uh, the conclusion from this uh, particular study was that brown boobies lay a second egg as an insurance egg to the first egg. 
if this should fail, perhaps. So I'll just check the time. Okay. Uh, so then we continue. Now to what we call facultative siblicide. And this study was done in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, so this is also an experimental test of one of the hypotheses why uh, of the occurrence of the facultative siblicide. Uh, some biogeography, this species native Africa and Asia, reached Americas in the late 19th century, probably with boats, we say, having it. First found in South America in 1877, and reached US in 41 and started nesting by 53. So in the next 50 years, became one of the most abundant North American herons, or eagles. And we now have, uh, do you have it breeding here in, in Czech Republic? Maybe not? Yeah, you have it breeding here also. Yeah. Since two years. Mm -hmm. So this study was made in Oklahoma, I said. The panhandle state, it looks like, I the, the state looks like pointing a gun like this <laughs> with, the, with the figures. Uh, and uh, some um, more of natural history to the eaglet is that why they call cattle eaglets, because they, they follow the, the, e the cattle. And when they move, they stir up insects. And uh, so they eat a lot of grasshoppers and crickets, but also frogs and, and other things that they encounter. And they are also colonial breeding. Uh, this you see chicks that look <laughs> like freeze <laughs> coming out from the nest. Uh, so they are grown up chicks. Uh, so they breed in, in colonies with uh, other herons on islands, isolated woods and swamps. They have variable clutch size, one to nine eggs, but median is three eggs. So the aim of this study was to test this, what we call the food amount hypothesis. So this state that suicidal behavior is maintained and related to the amount of food that is delivered to the nest. So uh, what we did in this study was to try to manipulate the food. And the prediction was to try to find that to obtain a negative relationship between feeding rate and fighting rate within cattle groups, cattle breed groups. And in order to study this, you can imagine how can you do this? Uh, yeah, just a second. Uh, th this study was performed yeah, in a colony of about 2,500 breeding pairs in the deciduous forest in Oklahoma. And you know, Oklahoma is the state of tornadoes. So that can sometimes mean that you have to, to skip some field work. But uh, we, we were lucky. They most of the time occur in April. Uh, so yeah, to observe this, we, we put up hides. Uh, much bigger hide than this, but this one is uh, just to show you that we made, we studied observations from these hides. And when when they were parents were feeding the young, and um, so we we did observations of the the chick uh, from a focal sample of the nest because we couldn't of course see all of the nest. So we tried to see identity of chicks fighting, and who strikes who, and. Um, Feeding observations, we did who gets to feed, how many feeds does it get, and also, if possible, what kind of food items. So 
uh, I said we also made an experiment, and, the and that was to give them some extra food during nesting rearing. And we had two different treatments. Uh, we had what we called bee chicks received extra food, and some roads the sea chicks received extra food. I'll come back a little bit later to details of the experiment. Um, so we searched during egg laying for ones that laid three eggs. And you remember that was a big variation. And uh, it was the most common clutch size there. And we randomized treatment groups. And the extra food was delivered to the young by putting these food pieces of mice directly into the gap of the young. And we had an EB group, we called the bee chick received extra food, and C, EC group, the, e, the C chick received extra food. And yeah, this extra food was given to the chick each second day. And we gave them 50 gram of mice each time. And this is about the same average cost of growth per day between days 5 to 50 when we made this experiment. And we marked these chicks on the head, like you see here, upon hatching. Although this is not the <laughs> catalytic chicks. I <laughs> uh, used picridasis and young salt, which is supposed to be good for the not hurt the young. So then it made it easy to observe the identity of young. If we put hatching first, A chick, hatching second, B chick, or hatching third, C chick. So to the results. Uh, On the y-axis, you see proportion of fledged young. And this on the x-axis, you see the fledging success at 15 days, 20 days, and 25 days. And uh, the control and the EB group and this EC group. And there are some differences between. You see that it declines uh, a little bit from 15 to 20, 25. But there was no significant difference at all in regarding to fledging success between these treatments. Uh, either during 15 days, during 20 days, or 25 days. So no difference in fledging success. Then we checked for fighting rate. Uh, maybe they, there should be less fighting rate, and uh, yeah, it seems to be a little bit higher fighting rate in the E, B, and C group, but there is quite a large variation, so this doesn't even show that there was any difference in, in fighting rate between these, between these groups. And then we checked also the feeding rate. It seems to be higher feeding rate where we actually fed the easy chick maybe contrary to what we expected, but it was no significant difference. And the ultimate test of the food demand hypothesis would be the correlation between feeding rate and fighting rate. So we should expect them to, to fight less if they get more food. And what do we find? On the x-axis, you have feeding rates, feedings per hour, and on the y-axis, fighting rate. And you see that there's a significant negative correlation. So that means that if the parents feed them more, they will fight less. More or less the same as you as uh, humans. If you feed and treat the chicks right, <laughs> your, your offspring right, they will fight less. Well, that's ma more complicated with humans, of course. So in conclusion to this second study, there was a neat difference in fight rate between treatments, but we find a significant relationship between feeding rate and fight rate. So this data supports then the food demand hypothesis. So when parents delivered more food to the nest, 
Ziblin thought less, indicating that nesting hunger was beginning to kill its ideal behavior. So, uh, the third, st third study I will present today is about raptors, and this is about black kite in southern Spain. Uh, the black kite is the relative to the red kite that you have here also in Czech Republic. Uh, but the black kite is maybe just seen by and there. You see in by and it's breeding here, uh, but not so much as the red kite, or maybe increasing. <laughs> it's decreasing the black kite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because I think that has been a general phenomenon in. In, in Europe, if you look on a latitudinal variance, that the black kite is increasing in the south and red kite is increasing in the north. And in Sweden, for example, we have a quite a lot of red kites now in the southern Sweden. So this study was made in Cotodoniana, as you see there. This is Cotodoniana, a lot of wet and a lot of co uh, combinations of different habitats. One of the most important for migrating uh, ducks, geese, and so on is uh, the wetlands that you have here. And uh, it's quite famous national park. You need uh, permission to go inside, for example. And it's surrounded by nature reserves. And there you have this uh, nice species, Siberian lynx, lynx pardina, which is a really critically endangered species that I've been fighting for, for a long time to, to protect this species. And uh, there are also sand dunes in this park. So it's a mixture of many things. And uh, the aim of the study we have here was to investigate if there exists a connection between cyclicide behavior and drug reduction. And uh, also, uh, I wanted to study the correlation here beside behavior reduction and uh, and also how it can be related to local breeding density if uh, if there could be some extra yeah if this could add uh, as an extra explanation so if like on a um, larger scope can affect family business Again, as we can even see in humans, large things can affect family things. Uh, so, just to remind you again that factors are civil civilized, that chicks can fight heavily over resources brought by parents, sometimes but not always lead to nesting mortality, in reverse to the obligate civilized, right? The second one kicks one one out of the nest or, or kills it in the nest. And uh, that civilized reduction is a strategy for adjusting family size to, to reduction in food level. Or as could also be seen as an insurance for loss of eggs or young due to other factors. Uh, so for studying this in relation to breeding density, we had three different sites. So if you look on the right, here you see uh, this is um, hmm, the, the dotted thing. This is the Doniana National Park. And it's surrounded then by, by nature reserves. So roughly 50,000 hectares is the national park, this, and 50, 000, surrounded by 50,000 hectares of nature reserves which have less um, uh, uh, yeah, jurisdictions. And so we selected three areas. Uh, Matagordas, which is actually just outside the National Park, but it's in the Nature Reserve. And it's the biological reserve, 
which is this brown, and La Algaida, which is between them. So that this differs in the number of black kite pairs nesting in in this uh, area. And uh, so we had three different areas, Matagordas with high breeding density, biological reserve, median, and Algaida low breeding density. This you see is typical uh, bushes like step area with the scattered oaks. And you remember I did this work with the cattle eagles and uh, Oklahoma. And there I saw that in this high breeding density of cattle eagles, we there was fighting in the broods. But at the same time, I saw some other nests where there was this other species, little blue heron. I never saw any single-sided heather. They never picked on each other. But they were scattered. They were among these 2,500, there were maybe yeah, 15, 20 pairs. So uh, the predictions from this study was to find more broad reduction in kite, black kite nests where we have seen plebiscite behavior. And secondly, that it, this should be more common in areas with the higher local breeding density. That was our prediction. Just to give some background of the black kite, here you see two newly hatched chicks. Uh, the female alone incubates eggs, which is very common among raptors. I think most raptors do that. Uh, and the incubation takes more or less one month. And females brew the nestlings of the hatching when males do most of the hunting, also very most common in, in raptors. And later, both males and females share duties of bringing food to the nestlings. And time to fledging takes another one, one month and 10 days, so almost one half month. So the black kite, as well as the red kite that you see below, is a medium-sized raptor. They are long-lived, so they should take care about the reproduction because don't waste everything now because you have another year and another year and another year, and etc. to invest in your offspring. Brood reduction is said in the literature to be common, and uh, they have seen stupid behavior in other studies, but maybe don't know how common it is. Egg laying in the one to four eggs. So the method we have in this study was to observe at the nest aggressive behavior of siblings when arriving to the nest and also record the wounds and pecking marks on the chicks, which is very easy to to see. Now these are, are just touched, so, so you cannot see it on this, but you can see if they've been fighting, you, you see scars on, on the heads on, or on the body. And these scars are indications of early fight between chicks in the nest. So the results. Uh, brood reduction was common in this population of black cats. So 64% of all the nests had some brood reduction. And identity of the chick was the mark the chick uh, was in 87% was the last hatched chick. Here you see how the brood size hierarchy can look like. So uh, there you have two chicks, what we could call the A and B chicks, and the smaller C chicks. So there could be quite a big disparity between the chicks. But although this one, the smaller one here, looks quite healthy. It doesn't have any marks or scars or anything. And that's uh, another aspect we can discuss later, how this can come about. So we did some uh, logistic aggression analysis. And uh, we know that sibling size differences are prerequisite 
for the evolution of civilized behavior, which in turn can lead to reduction. So we did this logistic regression analysis, where you have a dependent variable, which is reduction, if it is reduced or not. And then we have independent variables, like sibling size, symmetry, brood size, could vary between two and three in these cases, and mean age of both parents. Because they in this population, the adults have been marked during a number of years, so you could know the age. And then the results. Uh, we saw that there was a significant effect of sibling size asymmetry, so with, uh, with the more differences between the siblings, the, the more we had brood reduction. There were no effects of parents, uh, and no effect of brood size. So of these three variables, sibling size asymmetry had the strongest ex effect for explaining occurrence of brood reduction. And uh, also brood reduction occurred in 89% of all nests in, in which we saw sibicide behavior. We had the null hypothesis on no relationship in this test, so this showed that there was a significant effect of sibicide behavior. So this indicates this will eventually lead to brood reduction. Uh, then maybe to the more interesting part of this study, sibicidal behavior in relation to breeding density. Here we saw that with the higher density of the local populations of black kites, we had also a higher uh, incidence of sibicidal behavior. It stands fratricidalness, I see there now. Uh, yeah, fratricide is another word for for sibicide that has been used maybe much earlier in, in the literature. And we also checked breeding density and brood reduction, which shows also that there was with a higher breeding density, we had a higher incidence of brood reduction. So in summary, the black kites, Sibling size asymmetry was the strongest variable for predicting brood reduction. There was a clear relationship between sibicide behavior and brood reduction. And sibicide behavior as well as brood reduction was most common there with highest breeding density of black kites. So, in conclusion, what uh, what conclusions can we draw from this from this study? Yeah, that competition between seedlings for the food supplemented by parents was most intense in the area with the highest density. That we can conclude. Or as an alternative. Another alternative is that may this may be not mutually exclusive parents could favor the competition between seedlings in areas with high breeding density by creating a larger size asymmetry being seen between seedlings in these areas. And they could do this by start to incubate long before clutch completion. So if they lay three eggs, start to incubate on the first egg, they lay the second egg, they continue incubate. So you can imagine the first egg will hatch much earlier. So they can create this sibling size asymmetry by themselves, the females. And by also saying this, you could imagine that, yeah, it could also be sexual conflict here. Maybe the females could, could manipulate this, which also may be not in the interest of the, the male. Maybe he wants, no, don't start to incubate. I want all siblings the same size. <laughs> If they start to incubate on the same day, all will hatch at the same time. 
uh, or and also in relation to that to sexual conflict it could also be even more complicated that maybe yeah this female the young female maybe she cannot do anything but just start to incubate or it could be old female that thinks ah this is a young male I'm pairing to now therefore I need to create this size similarity because I don't trust that he will be may be able to, to feed feed the young so much. Uh, so we could have also age, sex, uh, um, how do you say, interactions there. In this, yeah, we can call like a game. So, uh, and also this uh, stabilized behavior and brood subsequent brood reduction could be explained as a mechanism for regulating femicides and the impact could also have well effect on population regulation so that that if there is a higher density uh, the population could be regulated downwards due to brood reduction and increasing the family size yes so uh, as an overall summary, in the first study, we studied obligate siblicide, and we show, saw an, in this experiment an insurance benefit of the second egg by brown boobies. In the second study of the cattle eagles in Oklahoma, we saw a negative relationship between feeding rate and fight rate, which supports this food amount hypothesis. And in the su third studies, Sibicide behavior was most common in the area with the highest breeding density. And with those words, thanks to collaborators, students, sounds, and uh, thank you for listening. And I'll be ready to take questions. Yeah, it's a very good question. And uh, this is a puzzle not only for civilizational uh, behavior, uh, it's also a puzzle with all these species, altricial species, that lay several eggs and seems to invest differently in the eggs. So it's really a puzzle. Uh, but it could, of course, be related to um, that she is trading off quantity and quality. So if she uh, pairs to a male that that she got maybe this this is what she got she, she couldn't uh, get maybe the best male maybe she is not old enough yet or it could also be related to territory quality maybe they are in a, they didn't get the best territory we know that there are differences in in qualities of territory uh, which has been seen experimentally by removing individuals from from the center, and then new ones come in. So it could be related territory quality, and also she's making a trade-off that she realizes that I cannot get these three young. I laid three eggs, but I realized I will only get out two. So therefore, start to yeah. So 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 to stimulate the sibling size hierarchy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we we uh, it's a very good question. I uh, we we state here that it's mainly due to hatching failure because uh, they have a really high hatching failure. 
but as we saw I in this, uh, that the difference between control and experiment just continue to increase. So it is, yeah, I it's not uh, uh, completely only hatching failure. Probably uh, other things also related. Yeah, yeah, that, th I mean, that's complicated this question because there are in this population of about 1,000 individuals I in this colony, there are, are uh, a number of um, individuals, let's say 20%, that laid only one egg. Yeah, they, they obviously have a, have a, have a lower ha um, fledging success. Yeah. So the hatching success is always like, yeah, 50%. 50% or so. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and um, also, even in this species, we know that, you know, that we mark the eggs with A and B. And in many cases, the A egg is actually larger than the B egg. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The coldness, I think, here is uh, not the problem. <laughs> it's the heat. Yeah, it's the heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the heat. Yeah, yeah. Same thing, but but, but yeah, the other way around. Yeah, yeah. That could be the case. Yeah, but there, you know, there is al also this energy constraints. I mean, always there is energy constraints, and one of the constraints could be that mm, they didn't get enough food uh, to lay two eggs. So th that that's one one. Yeah, in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we move around. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I, the ones that get two eggs for the first uh, in the uh, in the control groups that have two eggs because uh, we had uh, yeah we had only this control. Uh, you could also switch egg for for frog, frog take from one to to another, but we we didn't do that anyway. So with the control group was the parent that had laid the two eggs was the one that was incubating those eggs. And of course, in many cases, they were only hatching one egg. But in some cases, or <laughs> in, uh, in uh, quite a number of cases, of course, there were two ha chicks that hatched. And then after, yeah, 10 days, these chicks that hatch, wha what happened is that when uh, the first uh, um, chick hatches and the 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 parents are are incubating the eggs uh, the the first one grows and then when it uh, the other one hatches or so after like 5 days it has the capacity to kick out the egg or if when the when the chick hatches it kicks out the the young yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It seems to be like yeah in, in their in their genes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we. I mean, we saw that we marked this. Remember the A and B, and we could, would see that the A 
and she's first, and the bee after that. But then just uh, because you know you can imagine we are we have thousands uh, of th one thousand or maybe five hundred nests of this one house thousand that we control. So we were walking around, so unable to be there just when this happened because it can happen within hours. So the, the, the second egg hatches, and within hours, the, the young one kicks out. The and the first one, one uh, think about this, why, why didn't the parent mm, try to retrieve it, to get it back to the, to the nest? But it seems that they don't do that. They don't have any... Uh, it, it, it occurs in, in some, uh, I've seen it occurs in some raptors, that the female, where, where the chicks have accidentally fallen out from the nest, that they try to, to get it back to the nest. But then there are facultative siblings out. Hmm. very good question. This is actually what we are trying to investigate now. Uh, and we uh, are doing a review about this. So so this is very, thank you for that question. I would put that to the acknowledgement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting. But uh, uh, we have also a complicating factor here that, that you have heard about extra pair copulation so that the female can get uh, sperm from, a, from another male. And then when you're in the nest, you can see that the relatedness between the siblings are not the same. So therefore you should expect maybe to have more extra pair copulations with more colony breeding species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also have, um, uh, they, yeah, it's related to, I mean, uh, that uh, they can only yeah, get, get one young, and, and they're very long-lived species. And uh, But of course, uh, one could also ask, why don't they lay two eggs there? And we actually have the same pattern within uh, many species of eagles, for example. They, they lay two eggs or three eggs, but, but uh, quite a lot few eagles lay two eggs, and also some are obligate siblings idle. But there are also a number of eagles that lay one egg. And there has been a review about this by Rob Simmons in South Africa, and he has shown that in those eagle species that lay only one egg, the egg is larger compared to the relative species. So that's kind of uh, curious that uh, it could also maybe ha have evolved this life history trait in Poseidoformis, as you say. Yeah, yeah, I can show you. I can answer first on that question. It's uh, the swallowtail kite that breed in uh, the Americas, both in the temperate zone and the tropics. The one that breeds in the tropic tropics are obligate siblicidal, and the one that breeds in the temperatures are uh, are facultative siblicidal. So in that case, it seems to be related to to the relativity. And again, very good question, because that's also in our review that we do now. <laughs> no, I, 
uh, these are all uh, all uh, yeah uh, kind of hypotheses that uh, that not not so much tested yeah yeah mm. <laughs> yes yeah it's for sure yeah 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 one second yeah. Yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. And also in mammals, uh, this, uh, they can do this, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, there are some studies uh, done on um, uh, on eagles again. Uh, I think by. Uh, Bortolotti, he in Canada, he did these studies on uh, on sex ratio in wolves. However, I'm I'm not sure about uh, if they could identify it to A and B and C and so on. So one should predict that the female would try to 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 skew it to to males the first hatching and females the late hatching because. They, they, yeah, they get bigger. Yeah, it ca can be quite a big difference uh, uh, in in size differences in in, in records. Yeah. yeah, but I will check up that. 